Business Security Weekly is recorded on Mondays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Each week, we address the challenges facing CISOs through our guest interviews, including former and active CISOs. Our news segment is focused on leadership and communication to better help security leaders translate and communicate security risks into business risks. Jason Albuquerque, Ben Carr, Tyler Robinson, and others add their expertise to the conversation. I'm Matt Alderman, and I hope you search for Business Security Weekly in your favorite podcast catcher and subscribe to download our latest content. Attackers are only getting more proficient, so how can you proactively adapt your cybersecurity strategy? Core Security by Fortra helps you uncover and prioritize the risks that pose the biggest threat to your organization. Core Impact is a penetration testing tool that safely finds and exploits vulnerabilities using the same techniques as attackers. You can conduct advanced pen tests with ease using certified exploits and automations. Take your engagements even further by pairing with our additional red teaming tools from Cobalt Strike and Outflank. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Fortra Core Security. Well, good morning, everybody, on this first full day of RSA 2023. I am pleased to be here with Chris Krugel, VP of Security Services at VMware. How are you? Very good. Thanks for having me. And uh, as you said, glad it's to be here. It's Monday morning. We're chipper still. Yeah, full of energy. Yep, yep. So let's dive right in. <clears throat> so we at Security Weekly have uh, talked a lot with our friends at VMware over the years, and we've talked a lot about lateral movement. Mm -hmm. And this year, VMware is really talking up lateral security. Yep. Break that down for me. No, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question and one that uh, we do here occasionally. I, I think uh, you already mentioned lateral movement, which is uh, definitely a, a closely related or important concept uh, when we talk about lateral security. And it really means uh, lateral security is our attempt to protect organizations against attackers that move laterally in organizations and uh, you know that try to break perimeters and then move along east-west uh, traffic routes and uh, try to get to sensitive data or deploy ransomware. And, uh, I think, you know, when you look at lateral security, I think it's also related to uh, the concept of zero trust, right? We all sort of understand that the perimeter is dead. You, you cannot just assume that everything that happens within the organization, within your data center, within the cloud is, is secure. And so there is a need to, to look at these the traffic, these communications, and uh, try to understand, is it allowed? Should I, should I prevent it? Should I block it? Uh, and... I think the, the, the problem is that when you look at zero trust, a lot of people sort of always think about segmentation, access control, and, and, and those concepts. And I think with lateral security, we really want to point out, yes, that's an important concept of zero trust. Yes, you need to be able to segment. You need to make sure that attackers cannot just move arbitrarily around, but it's also important to look at the connections that your security policies, that your segmentation policies allow, and determine if they are actually malicious or not. So really looking at the threats within those connections as well. And I think that's what we want to basically express with lateral security. Hey, of course it's important, east-west is a battleground, but it's not enough to just look at segmentation and access control. It's also important to do threat detection for, the, for that traffic as well. Yep, so around the topic of lateral security, VMware has several announcements. So talk me through, please, um, the different product announcements and where they all, how they all fit together. Of course, happy to. Um, maybe I want to even sort of take a step back and then tell you first a little bit uh, what we think that these products should do or what are sort of the capabilities that uh, we want to to provide to the market and then you know talk a little yeah, bit about the products please, that please that, please do yeah that that sort of deliver this so the first point of course is you know when you look at um, sort of lateral security and east-west traffic is is the question around 
visibility? Like, how do you even see all that that connection, uh, all these connections that are happening, and, and how can you apply your policies or analytics to it? And I think this is something where um, you know we don't necessarily specifically announce anything this year, but we have actually been talking about this for many years about the need to inspect every connection. Right? You cannot have blind spots, and that is really obvious but it's important and it's also challenging because if you look at um, like typical network security solutions how do they see all that east-west traffic right how can you actually see see every connection and um, what we have seen is that in many cases you know you have to sort of twist the network a little bit you have to hairpin connections through some centralized bottleneck so you have to deploy taps and try to you have copies of the packets and you try to send them to some centralized analytics platform. And that is, you know, it's, it's costly, it's cumbersome, the network architects hate this. Uh, you might not see uh, traffic between VMs that are happening, let's say, on the same hypervisor because it never actually hits the, hits the network. So it's, it's hard to actually get to the traffic. And then once you get to the traffic, of course, you can make different decisions. You can apply your policies or you can look, look for threats. And, um, you know, we have this year and also uh, last year already started with a number of interesting announcements around, okay, how do we actually screen that traffic that, you know, we, we have this unique ability to see everywhere with our distributed architecture uh, that sits in each hypervisor. How can we find bad stuff in there? And so we have a, a range of capabilities in our product, which is NSX uh, uh, ATP, NSX Advanced Threat Protection, uh, that allows us to to look for known signs of attacks, for previously unknown signs of attacks using some machine learning techniques, happy to talk about this, as well as a sandbox and malware detection capabilities that look for maybe ransomware that is in that traffic. So wide range of capabilities where we're excited to show, you know, better analytics and better detection capabilities. And then another part that is, is happening uh, at, at RSA this year is then how do we combine our network view with endpoint view, right? There's always the question of, okay, so you have network security, you have network detection response, you have your firewalls, but then you also have endpoint protection tools, EDR tools. And so how do you really combine them well? And of course, that's sort of the, the XDR buzzword that has been around for a while, but I think it's time now to actually move beyond the talk and really deliver product capabilities that can take advantage of this additional context. And so we're excited to show how we we do take information from endpoint, uh, from agents, from Carbon Black, as well as our own guest introspection capabilities that we have in VMs, from VMware tools, and really amp up our capabilities on the network as well. So walk me through each of the product components and how each work individually and then how they tie in. Yeah, so at the basic, level when we are basically talking about sort of network visibility and segmentation. Uh, we have a product that is called NSX uh, and NSX is our connectivity and security solution for data center cloud, multi-cloud networks. Mm -hmm. um, when you basically get that basic tool, that basic platform, what you get is that connectivity and security fabric that really instruments or augments each node in your network, each hypervisor in your network. So that gives you the basic visibility because now you see all the connections and you, you're able to now look for allowed or, or rather expected connections versus unexpected connections and you can define and enforce your policy. So that's really our basic product is network segmentation, micro segmentation with the basic NSX platform. And then, um, you know, you would be able to, to opt for the NSX ATP extension, expansion, where you then can get all the threat detection capabilities that basically you know, look for signs of badness in the traffic that the policies would still allow. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are sort of the basic two components. And there's a third one which we call NSX as a service or North Star, where you now get a control pane, plane that is running in our cloud, and it basically allows you to manage different deployments of NSX, the ones that I sort of have mentioned, with or without ATP, in different environments, either in your data center or in, in, in different clouds, and you basically can enforce 
in an easy way consistent security policies across all these different deployments, as well as you can perform threat detection where events that might happen in different deployments or in different locations get all centrally correlated, mapped against the MITRE attack framework and really show you a sort of end-to-end -end story, right? Because it might be the attackers come in through some server that you forgot somewhere in the native public cloud and then that is used as a stepping stone to get into one data center where they might get access to a bastion host to jump into yet another data center and you would really like to see the whole end-to-end -end kill chain mm -hmm. and with that sort of NSX as a service, that North Star backend, we would see all these events, we can correlate them for you and we would show you the complete end-to-end -end picture of that, that intrusion. And then of course, uh, if you can get partners like Carbon Black, right, so you can purchase a Carbon Black EDR agent that you can then install on those workloads and they would integrate with the NSX solution to give you a more comprehensive XDR style protection. Yeah, the Carbon bl Black part is interesting because this all strikes me as a culmination. So I know Carbon Black entered the picture with VMware last year. A few years ago, actually, 2020. 2020. Yeah. And, um, but with this week's announcements, yes, we, we you start really to see where the, the wheel and the spokes are set up. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we've always had, um, you know, a number of different pieces in our portfolio, you know, NSX from network security, we have Carbon Black EDR, there's Velo Cloud's uh, SASE solution, we have uh, additional components that allow users to manage and secure native public clouds like cloud posture management uh, with ARIA. So it's a, and unfortunately it's not very well known, it's sort of like a, the, the best kept secret of the security industry. We have a very broad portfolio of capabilities that really address all these different needs. And yeah, we have been really hard at work over the last few years to integrate them together, combine them, and, and provide our solution, uh, you know, or our customers one solution that really allows them to leverage different bits but integrate them well ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah, now talk about, uh, you're just announcing it this week, but I would imagine a lot of customer discussions have happened already around this. Yep, no. Talk about the, um, key challenges that customers are hoping that this will help them. You've already mapped out a lot of it, mm -hmm. but when you're having those conversations, what comes up a lot? So, for example, this year at RSA, there's a lot of buzz around all things artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so when you get questions around that, how do you tie it back into what... VMware is doing and announcing this week. Yeah, so you know, I think artificial intelligence has been always an important cornerstone of our products just because, you know, it is what allows you on one hand to deal with things you have not seen before, right? So it's like unexpected um, things that you could not cover with reputation or signature-based solutions. But I think it also has an important aspect that goes towards automation, right? It's this idea that, hey, you have some tasks that are really cumbersome, you don't have the people to do this, and you need something that automates maybe some workflows, right? And mm -hmm. when people think about automation, it's often like, do you have APIs, do you have integrations? Sure, but it's also about, okay, can AI help you to find patterns in a sea of data that you didn't know were there? Can it surface and, and, and sort of help you triage and at least take, for example, the role of a SOC 1 analyst and sort of really put the focus of the humans to where it matters. And so mm -hmm. that is something that really resonates with, uh, with customers because they say, you know, we have all these products, everything is very complicated, uh, you know, getting this thing to operationalize, that's hard. And if you can help me actually, you know, maybe we have purchased some VMware portfolio products, like help me put this together, help me actually really realize the cost savings and the speeds that we were hoping for in getting this, then they get really happy about this. And I think, uh, you know, with, with recent announcements and developments, that's exactly what we focus on. Like, yes, we have all the pieces. Yes, we use uh, AI, for example, very broadly. Um, and, and now, like, how can you help me tie together and automate it and, and uh, sort of use AI even for that meta level for that next step? 
Great. Well, good luck this week, Chris. Um, pleasure talking you. to you. And I'll see you around the showroom floor. No, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, always great to chat with you. Thank you. Have a great week. Welcome to RSA Conference 2023. We are broadcasting live from Broadcast Alley. I am Jeff Mann. I'm a co-host in Paul Security Weekly, and I'm sitting here with Teresa Lanowitz. Teresa is the head of cybersecurity evangelism for AT&T Business. Teresa, welcome to RSA. Thank you so much, Jeff. It is awesome to be here in Broadcast Alley. This is just uh, just so exciting. It's awesome to be back at real live yeah. conferences. We're still seeing that after, yeah. after years of lockdown and shutdown. Um, tell us about this thing that's sitting next to us. AT&T's put out, how many years has this been? So this is our 12th edition. 12th this, edition. This is the AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report. It's our 12th edition, and it's launching today. April 24th here at RSA. Okay. And so this is the 12th edition, and what we've been doing for the past four editions is really taking a look at how this new generation of network, lower latency, higher bandwidth, is really impacting the next generation of computing and what you're doing to secure those assets that you're putting on that new style of network. So what you're doing to secure the data, the applications, the endpoints, and so on. And so this one is really focused on the edge ecosystem. and. That ecosystem is internal as well as external. So, okay. you know, some of the things we found from this edition of the report, this is a qualitative report as well as a quantitative report. It's a quantitative report, global audience. We surveyed 1,418 people for this report. Wow. From security, line of business, application development, network, operations organizations uh, from around the world. Right. And um, what they told us this year was that security is not a do-it-yourself activity as you're moving to the edge. Mm -hmm. So you really need that internal collaboration. So we're starting to see those silos that have been erected over the past 40, 50 plus years. We're starting to see those break down. Mm -hmm. But what they also told us was that bringing in that third-party trusted advisor was critically important for them. Hey, before we get too far, um, I always like to qualify topics uh, for our listening audience, not assume that everybody knows everything right. that we talk about. Can you just give us a real brief rundown of what we're talking about when we talk about the edge? Yeah, so if you talk about edge, and edge is a really, really popular term right now, mm -hmm. and that definition of edge is really in flux. Okay. And depending like every other term in our exactly. industry. Okay, okay. <laughs> so depending upon who you talk to, and that definition tends to skew to, if you're a vendor, it tends to skew to the tech stack that you're selling. Right. If you're an enterprise user of that, of that technology, it tends to skew towards that stack that you're using. Gotcha. So what we did for the purpose of this report, we said there are three common characteristics that you need to think about when you think about edge. Okay. The first, it's software defined, and that can be on-prem or in the cloud. Okay. Secondly, your workloads, your applications, it's closer to where that data is being generated and consumed. Mm -hmm. And then the third characteristic is it's that distributed model of management, intelligence, and networks. And if you think about those characteristics, you say, okay, that's pretty academic, but think about it in real life. We've all experienced edge computing. Mm -hmm. Think about going into a public parking structure and you have those boards that say, you know, level one, there are two spots available. And you say, well, I'm not going to drive around, I'll go up to level two. Right. Level two, you know, 40 spots available. That's edge computing. It's that near real-time information because that data, when a car pulls out of that parking spot, that data is not being backhauled to a data center somewhere. It's living right there on that edge. So that's how we have defined those three common characteristics. Okay. And we've seen edge use cases really, really evolve over the past couple of years. So there's a lot of business benefit. Organizations are looking at this saying, we need to really figure out what the business outcome is going to be for edge mm -hmm. and what we're going to do because they see it as a business differentiator. So I'm guessing one of the questions and something that's addressed in the report is what are the problems, what are the security issues mm -hmm. that uh, all these companies and organizations that are trying to deal with the edge are experiencing so that you're getting you know, real feedback from real edge users right. yeah. or consumers. Yeah. yeah, most definitely. And we surveyed seven different industry verticals. Okay. So healthcare, retail, finance, energy and utilities, manufacturing, transportation, and U.S. SLED, so state, local government, and higher education. And so in the report, we talk about use cases for all seven of these industries. Mm -hmm. And we also show where we were last year, from the research from last year to the research from this year. 
So things from a financial perspective, things like real-time fraud prevention mm -hmm. from manufacturing, smart warehousing from U.S. SLED, smart buildings. So there are a lot of really interesting edge use cases. And we found that 57% of our survey respondents are either in proof of concept mode, partial implementation, or full implementation. So that's really compelling news, really important information to come out. But one of the things that we also found is that organizations are saying, you know what, right now for the edge, the common endpoints that we're using are laptops, desktops, tablets, and phones. Mm -hmm. And 48% of people said, yeah, th those are those most common endpoints. But 30% of our participants said, you know what, we're looking at these new intentional purpose-built devices for edge computing. So things like autonomous robots, autonomous vehicles, autonomous drones, um, wearables for after surgery, uh, you know, things that only give you exactly the information you need, you don't have that bloat of the, of the software stack and so on. Hmm. So there's some really interesting stuff going on there. It's uh, fascinating and scary all at the same time. <laughs> I was uh, in Phoenix for a few days uh, o you know, over the weekend visiting family on my way out here and we were out driving one afternoon and they had, a, I forget what the, the company is and I shouldn't endorse them, but they had you know, a driverless car, it, that, that's one of their test beds. And it was just a little unnerving to look over and see <laughs> nobody behind the wheel of a car that's driving right beside you. Yeah, going at those the, speeds, right? <laughs> It put me on edge, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, so you, 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 you mentioned seven verticals. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would imagine like all things in the cyber security and the IT world, there's, there's a lot of things that are uniquely the same and there's a lot of things that are uniquely different. Anything that really stood out that's reflected in the report? Yeah, the interesting thing is we see a pretty balanced approach to investment for security, and that's mm -hmm. across the board. So you said uniquely the same and then uniquely different. Mm -hmm. So across all industries, they told us that on average, they're investing 22% 20, of their overall edge budget in security. Hmm. And you think, well, 22%, okay, but what does that compare to? We asked them about security, applications, mm -hmm. network, and then strategy and planning. So network was 30%, applications 23%, strategy and planning 23%, and security 22%. So the reason I am so encouraged by that is if you think back just three, five years, people would not be investing proactively right. that much in security. So, and again, that's an increase from what we found last year. Last year, the security investment was somewhere between 11 to 21 percent, was kind mm -hmm. of the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. But this year, we're seeing 22 percent across the board. Organizations are saying they're investing in security. So there's that balanced investment, which goes back to that idea of those silos that we've built up in our IT organizations over the past four or five plus decades mm -hmm. are starting to erode. So it's no longer just one team saying, hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to give all my money to this one area. And oh, security, you're an afterthought, applications, you're an afterthought. Right. Because if you think about it, the applications are starting to change as well. Right. Those applications will be far more ephemeral. They'll be headless, non-GUI types of applications. And we're getting away from that idea of we're sitting there at our laptops we're sitting there at our, our tablets or our phones. It's about machine-to-machine -machine communication and getting that relative near real-time information. Right. So what is, um, you know, I come from the traditional world. I've been doing this a long time where, you know, the, in the early days of uh, what we used to call internet security, it was all about securing the perimeter and keeping everything safe on the inside. And I can, I can see the nuance between edge and perimeter because edge is mm -hmm. significantly different from nobody's trying to get in anymore because everybody's outside of <laughs> exactly. the, there is no in. Yeah. Um, what, what are some of the challenges that security teams are facing in trying to uh, I can't imagine that they do the traditional anymore with edge technologies. They've got to come up with new ways of doing new things. Right. It, it, and touch on that a little bit. It's all it's in all there, in right? There. So, and this is a very comprehensive report, 52 pages. Wow. One of the things we see is that the more organizations 
put out edge use cases in either full or partial implementation, mm -hmm. the more they're aware of the cybersecurity controls that they need. And I think where we are, there's this cultural shift in cybersecurity right now. And the thinking is changing from this legacy thinking, you know, like you said, right. the perimeter, kind of everything's inside our I'm data center. I'm a dinosaur, center. I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> but everything's kind of in our data center too. Right. Everything's now at the edge and we have to think differently about this. And even in terms of the types of attacks that we're seeing, the one of the really, really interesting data points in here is that the top attack that people were concerned about this year is DDoS. The top mm -hmm. attack that they were concerned about last year in 2022 was ransomware. Interesting. And if you think about what has happened with ransomware, all the big ransomware attacks we had in 2021, mm -hmm. everybody bolstered their security hygiene. Everybody said, you know, we're going to train people what to click on, what a malicious link looks like, that sort right. of thing. And as an industry, we're going to patch our systems because yeah. we finally have a reason to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, patching is a really interesting point as well in the, in this report. Uh -huh. But um, so, you know, ransomware kind of people feel as though, yeah, they've done a lot. But now DDoS is starting to come apart. And this is kind of that progression of, here we are, legacy cybersecurity, now we're moving to the edge. So we're going to suddenly start to think a little bit differently. So DDoS, that old fashioned DDoS attack is now coming back because mm -hmm. we're living now in a world of things, right? We're moving away from the laptops and the desktops and the tablets. So we're living in those sensors inside of a parking garage. We're living inside of wearables that we might have for right. post-surgery. So to actually execute a DDoS attack is something that an adversary can really get a lot, you know, gain a lot with. And then work in conjunction, of course, you know, with a ransomware gang. So that idea of uh, DDoS coming back is kind of the top attack vector that we're seeing. And that's what we saw across the board. That was the most common one. Hmm. And in the report, we have it broken down by different industries. So for example, you know, manufacturing, they're very, very concerned about attacks against the endpoint. Mm -hmm. Financial services, they're very concerned about business email compromise. So you can take a look at it and see that different industries are worrying about different things. And what I always advise people to do is take a look at this report, use it as a guide to start the discussion inside of your own organization. Everybody's thinking a little bit differently. Everybody's looking at things differently. Do you concur with what your organizational peers, your, your financial or your, uh, your industry peers are saying? Or are you kind of seeing something completely different? Right. So, so um, AT&T obviously knows a little bit about the networks and, <laughs> and knows all of them. Um, what is AT&T AT business offering to help clients out beyond giving us a lot of good information. Yeah, so AT&T Cybersecurity, mm -hmm. we offer two ways for our clients to engage with us. The first is through cybersecurity consulting, mm -hmm. and the second is through our AT&T Cybersecurity Managed Security Services. Okay. So that's the two ways to engage with AT&T Cybersecurity. And we also have Alien Labs, which, are, which is our threat intelligence unit for AT&T Cybersecurity. Gotcha. And that Alien Labs Threat Intelligence Unit works in conjunction with OTX, the Open Threat Exchange, with mm -hmm. something like 200,000 people from around the world, cybersecurity professionals, discussing and submitting indicators of compromise. Our AT&T Alien Labs team takes that, enriches the data that's coming through in the indicators of compromise, and then they use that to really fuel everything that we're doing inside of our SOCs. So we have nine global SOCs that operate 24-7, 365, um, every type of certification you want, our cybersecurity consultants have it, our mm -hmm. cybersecurity SOC analysts have it. So we offer a variety of ways to really engage. Super. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time away from your busy conference schedule to sit down and chat with us. Really excited. I'm not going to do it this week. It's too busy, to, but to sit down and... and digest this report. Uh, for those listening, if you want to get uh, a copy of The Edge and, and learn more about what AT&T Business is doing, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash A-T-T-R-S-A-C. That's Alpha Tango Tango, Romeo Sierra, Alpha Charlie for you DOD types. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Teresa. Thank you so much, Jeff. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bill Brenner. VP of Content Strategy at Cyber Risk Alliance and Security Weekly. And I hope everybody who is here is enjoying day one of RSA Conference 2023. I'm very pleased to be sitting here with 
Vinay Anand, Chief Product Officer at NetSpy. Welcome. Thanks, Bill. How are you? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing very well. Looking forward to the show. Um, so, NetSpy is all about, not just all about, but ESOM, External Attack Surface Management. And this is a topic a line of technology that still isn't quite as understood as it could be. So start by breaking that down to me. Talk about what external attack surface management is, what the goal is, how it works. Yeah, sure. So NetSpy is a leader in offensive security and mm -hmm. pen testing. So offensive security means looking at your entire IT estate and detecting where you are exposed from outside, from inside, all over, you know, uh, from outside the network, from inside applications, mobile vulnerabilities, IoT. We look at every part of your attack surface, uh, and we use a combination of automation, tools, platforms, mm -hmm. and pen testing. So we bring it all together to detect areas where you're exposed, and also detect what the risk is, and how important is that exposure. So that is the kind of the big picture. Now, coming to ASM, or attack surface management, this is a relatively new concept. Uh, the concept's been around, but in terms of products and, and presence in the market, it's only in the last few years that you've seen products come out into the market. Today, we are calling it EASM, external attack surface management. Started as ASM, and the basic premise here is you build scanners and automation to probe your network to detect where you're exposed. And when you do it from outside your boundaries, you, s you start identifying all the assets in your network that are exposed to the internet. Mm -hmm. That is the basic premise it started. And as the technology matured and people started getting comfortable with it, it started branching into external and internal. So there's this concept called EASM, external attack surface management. You also have something called CASM, continuous cyber, cyber asset attack surface management, which is more of an internal thing. But the premise here is you probe every asset to detect which ones are exposed. And then you detect what is exposed. Is it a port that's exposed? Is a secret key exposed at the app level or the protocol level? So you go up and down the stack, and then you look at a holistic approach to that particular asset, if it's a server or an or a EC2 instance or whatever else. Mm -hmm. And then you identify which areas are exposed. So that is the basic premise. And then you build technology on top of it for you know, a qualitative assessment of what you found. Now, as customers and prospective customers are coming to you to talk about external attack surface management, um, what are some of the pain points that are coming to you with looking for help? And, and talk about, tie that back into what you've just described in terms of yeah. what ESIM is. Yeah, so at a basic level, customers really are largely blind to what assets are exposed to the internet. Let's start from there. Some of them are intentional. You expose a server because you know, out, people outside your network needs to access it. It's either an e-commerce server or your partners have to access it for various reasons. You have a web server, etc. Oftentimes, you also expose assets because they're misconfigured mm -hmm. out of mistake, and they, that is a risk to your security. At other times, there's also shadow IT where people, usually in the development side or testing, bring up assets, bring up servers, they're doing something with it which is not necessarily approved or signed off by uh, InfoSec, and that might end up being exposed because it's not configured up on your security policies, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a combination of things that are intentional, you want to have them visible outside, things that are misconfigured or things that are just shadow IT. Customers don't have a holistic view of all of this. So they, the first thing they want to do is look at my estate and tell me what is exposed. And then we'll figure out how much of these is approved and how much of this is not approved. It starts from there. Mm -hmm. And then you look at vulnerabilities on each of these things that are exposed. Some assets may be exposed, but they may be harmless because they're so rock solid. There's no vulnerability. You can't do anything with it. But in some other cases, there are vulnerabilities associated with those assets, which make them high risk. And then, depending on how sophisticated the vendor is, uh, for instance, we are able to connect those exposed assets to other internal assets that are connected to it, and they could potentially be at risk because you have a, a door open. Mm -hmm. 
So you can take it forward to the next level and say, okay, we found all the assets that are exposed, out of which, let's say, 10 of them are not approved or, or danger to your environment. Out of those, there are four that are connected, there's a path to other more important assets inside your network. And this poses a bigger risk to you. And that is the entire journey that customers want. But most of the tools today, the automation, don't go that far because that context is missing. You can throw up a, a bunch of scanners and you can throw up a lot of information that says so many assets are exposed. But the qualitative assessment that goes in, which says out of these which are really vulnerable, which are not vulnerable, mm -hmm. and of those that have vulnerability associated with it, which of them actually expose real deep internal assets and which don't, for that you need much deeper analysis. So what we do is we pair automation with manual pen testing. And these are very well-trained expert pen testers deep in understanding of penetration testing and threats, they understand the company concept, the, the business context around this for, for each company. They're able to separate the signal from the noise. So we can generate a lot of noise, of course, like any automation. And then we separate signal from noise and we pare it down and say, out of everything we found, there are only four things you should really care about. That is the premise of what customers are looking for. So there's the triage. It's a triage yep. between automation, business context, deep testing, and understanding the net impact of the exposure. Not just that asset A is exposed, yep. but what could that lead to? Now, as is the case with any newer technology, where we've seen it over and over again, where a company is trying to correct their blind spots and they go in to buy a product like this, but they're not always asking all the right questions first to get a sense of how it what needs to work in their environment and how you would help them once deployed. Mm -hmm. Talk about some of the key questions. If somebody comes to NetSpy to talk about your, um, what you offer, what are some of the, the key questions you think they need to be asking so that you can better help them get to where they need to be? So I think most customers know what they want. They may not know how to ask for it. The basic premise everyone starts with is, I want to understand where I'm exposed and what my risk is. That's how it starts, and that is true. But then as you engage with the vendors, you realize if you don't ask the right questions, you get a lot of noise. You get a lot of data. Data is not information. You get a lot of data that's not triaged, as you said, or not correlated. You don't overlay business context with it. You don't overlay vulnerabilities and other things. So the questions customers should really ask is not just what am I exposed to, but what is the net effect? What is the impact of that exposure? Tell me what assets are exposed, but also tell me what is the impact of that exposure? Where am I at risk and how high is that risk for each asset? Quantifying that risk and the exposure is very important. And mm -hmm. I think that's a journey the industry is going through now. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. So, every year at RSA, the question comes up, what's the big talking point? Where is the <laughs> hype? For better or worse, this year, it's artificial intelligence. So, the risks of generative AI, but also, the benefits of artificial intelligence and how different security products use them. Talk about it in the context of ESIM and what NetSpy does. Yeah, <clears throat> so this is an interesting topic and I'm sure over the next two days we are going to hear a ton about AI and, and LLMs. So let's first be clear on what generative AI or LLMs do for us. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they're able to parse a huge amount of data, find the connections between them, and allow us to, in natural language, ask questions and get qualitative answers. Before this, what would happen is we'd build very sophisticated ML and rules where we say if A connects to B, B connects to C, and if this is the overlay, and if this is the context, et cetera, et cetera, then we, we throw an output. Now with LLMs, the system will, will absorb a lot of this data, create its own correlations, and give out very intelligent assessment on what it is. That is the, the you know, 
core intent of using LLMs or generative AI in, in this context. So what you need for this, you first need a large amount of data. Mm -hmm. And you need data that requires a lot of correlation and context. And if you, if you deliver all of that to a, a solidly trained LLM model, you can ask these questions. So in the context of EASM, if you do the right things with, let's say, LLMs, you could ask the question, tell me all the assets that are exposed to the internet. And it would tell you that. In, in a pre-LLM world, we would generate a report. We would do the same thing. We would write queries to the database. And there'll be very sophisticated queries. But you can take it further and say, of all these assets, tell me which ones are high risk. And the system will automatically tell you that. Then you can ask, of all the high risk assets, which ones are connected to my databases or data stores? Or which, which ones are connected to my PII information? Or how much risk is there to my you know, core servers or crown jewels because of this exposure? The system is supposed to churn all that data and tell you in a qualitative fashion what is happening. Now, without LLMs, you do the same thing, but it's a lot of modeling and correlation. So the industry has been on this journey for a long time. It's not like suddenly this came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. The concept of generative AI is probably new to the world, but the outcomes, the use cases, the ch problems we're trying to solve, we've all been working on it for a long time. Yeah. This just makes it easier to deliver more natural language-like answers rather than go into reports and dashboards and charts and graphs. Now, are you on the exhibit floor? Of course we are. Do you, do you know the booth number off the top of your head? No, but oh. I know where it is. <laughs> north, south, central? Um, we are in the north side. All right. So the North Expo Hall, check them out. Yeah, please come and visit us. A lot of interesting uh, innovation around offensive security, attack simulation, external attack management, ASM, a uh, lot of pen testing around every aspect of your attack surface and of your IT estate. So deep technology, a lot of interesting uh, stuff there. Do, do stop by. Well, it's been a pleasure. All Have right. a great week. Thanks, Bill. Take care.